Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin, this is Gospel Simplicity, and I am so glad that you're here today. Hey, last week we did an interview with Father Dwight Longenecker, and we only showed part one, and some of you might have felt like, what? Like, I would need to see the rest of this. I got a lot of comments, like, when is this next one coming out? If you're not, it, it, it's here, and here is part two. What you'll see, though, is the content of this part is substantially different than part one, that it, it made sense to separate them. In part one, we talked a little bit about a theology of marriage and priestly celibacy, and man, it was so fun. But in part two, we talk a bit about the, the gospel. Not a bit. I mean, it's entirely what we talk about. And we talk about this idea of moral therapeutic deism, and is Christianity asking enough of its followers? It was really fun. I hope you enjoy it. But before we get to it, I want to say a real quick thank you to my patrons, subscribers, and merch buyers who make this channel possible because of their support, especially my patrons who give monthly out of their deep generosity. This channel is able to stay sustainable, but also to continue to grow into exciting and new things like interviews like this and so much more. If you're interested in supporting the channel by becoming a patron or through either of the other things, you can use the link in the, in links in the description down below. I also want to say a thank you to our sponsor for today's video, Kindred. Kindred is a company that exists to help people reclaim sacred time with God. And they do that through making these beautiful Bibles complete with you know, full page illustrations that will force you to read slower and more contemplatively to allow you to engage with scripture in a new and profound way. I absolutely love what they're doing. They're a fantastic company. Their Bibles are beautiful, and you should definitely check them out by going to kindredapostle.com and use the promo code GOSPEL10 to get 10% off your order today. But with that being said, I hope you guys enjoy this part two of my interview with Father Dwight Longenecker. I wanted to get a little bit today into your book as well, uh, because I'm sure people are going to want to hear a bit about what you've done. You're a prolific writer. And today I, I did want to talk a bit about Immortal Combat, your book, Confronting the Heart of Darkness. And I think this segues well in the fact that there's always been struggles within the church with false teaching. And you also mentioned that today many people kind of bristle at the church's teaching on what seem to be some of the more difficult areas. And you uh, pointed out some of those within marriage, uh, such as pornography and different things like that, where people might feel, you know, do we really need to tell people what to do in their bedroom, or do we need to tell people what to do in this? And in the book, you talk about the fact that people are increasingly drawn towards like a feel-good gospel. Could you explain what that is and why you think that draw is? Yeah, I'm actually just completing a new book, which is called Beheading Hydra, um, a radical plan for Christians in an atheistic age. And um, one of the chapters, and what I do is I, I, I'm going through and I'm uh, explaining for people 16 isms that are um, prevalent in modern American society, which uh, are actually different forms of atheism. And I, I'm quite blunt about it. I said, look, let's not, let's not pretend here. This is materialistic. And if it's materialistic, it's atheistic. So let's not beat around the bush. Materialism is a form of atheism. And all these different isms are manifestations and result of basically a materialistic um, mindset. When I say materialistic, you'll understand I don't just mean going and shopping and and, and getting lots of stuff. I mean uh, the world, the worldview that this is this physical world is all there is. Um, and one of those isms that I'm looking at is uh, sentimentalism, which is uh, my feelings are the only true test of of authenticity and truth. Now. This has an interesting pedigree because it comes to us from the Enlightenment thinker Rousseau, uh, and Rousseau um, was the first to have this sort of great profound ex experience of nature and within himself, and he came out of it believing that na humans were good, uh, and therefore their feelings were good, and their feelings were, in interior feelings were the great expression of their goodness, and therefore that was the true guide. And it's interesting because he comes on the he comes in on the coattails of the of the Enlightenment, where, uh, of course, Descartes and the others were were, in, were saying that no, it's the reason is that the human reason is 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 the um, test for truth, and Rousseau swings away from that and 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 starts saying, oh no, it's this inner feeling that I've got. Well, um, 
he's at the end of the 18th century and and then he leads into the romantic movement in the 19th century and the romantic movement is is swinging right away from rationalism which was saying it's all this stuff and they're saying it's all heart and they're saying it's um it's how you feel you know like wordsworth i wandered lonely as a cloud and all this stuff um and that has been the foundation uh, a lot of these tr strands str strands are the foundation of really the modern western worldview um individualism it's all up to you and how you feel um, and your feelings are the, are the true guide to <clears throat> your uh, to your destiny and all this great stuff. And um, of course, that then leads to um, not just my emotional feelings, but uh, my instincts below the belt um, and Freudianism. And Freud comes along and says, he, he was really, he was a, a disciple of Rousseau. And, and Freud says, yeah, not only are your beautiful emotional feelings and, and lovely feelings about nature and everything beautiful and, and true, but also, uh, when they lead to, uh, certain instincts for, um, uh, sexual behavior, those two are valid and good. So go for it. And so, uh, this is why when Christians, um, try to take issue with uh, so many people in the world today. It's not that we disagree about particular rules and regulations, or maybe about sex or anything else. It's actually that we have a completely different worldview. Um, believers, really, we ought to face up, whether we're evangelicals or Catholics or Orthodox, we ought to face up to the fact that we have a radically different worldview than the majority of people in Western culture who've been educated in the secular materialistic world. And a friend of mine said, it's like playing t tennis on adjacent courts. Okay. You, 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 know, you can have all the arguments you like and, until the cows come home about, let's say, abortion. But if that person has a secular materialistic worldview, they, they don't actually have, they're not working with, they don't have the same tools in the toolbox as you do. Okay. So, and it's the same with sentimentalism and, and sentimentalism are just my feelings is just, is another one of those things. Yes. And it seems that today we often are catechized more by our culture and then paint this veneer of Christianity over top of it. And I think, you know, could, could you maybe point out, so when, when people take these isms and you call them out rightly as forms of atheism and they begin to marry that with at least Christian sounding teaching or a, a veneer of Christianity, what happens then? Uh, you're, you're really, t you're really hitting the hot button issues here today, you know, because this is, <laughs> this is um, my big criticism is that American Christianity is <clears throat> a huge part of it is, is is totally heretical. It, it's totally uh, contradictory to the historic faith, the biblical faith, um, and because of just what you said, it has not. It is woven in and accepted and actually baptized, not just accepted these false ideologies, but baptized them in the name of Jesus and portrayed them as a form of Christianity. If you take, for instance, um, uh. Well, I, I'm going to criticize evangelical Christianity here with this emphasis on, on the personal conversion experience, okay? Now, I, I got saved when I was five years old, and I, I really believe the personal conversion experience is really important. In fact, it's vital. However, if it is only lodged in a personal subjective emotionalism, then what we've done is we've taken sentimentalism from the world and baptized it said and and it'll be expressed in things like this well what really matters all that all that really matters is how much you love jesus well no that isn't all that really matters okay that really matters but it's not all that really matters okay um and the same thing is is true with uh, uh these other isms they, they they've they've um imported them to Christianity. And with well, the most extreme forms are things like the um, prosperity gospel preachers um, who have twisted the Christian gospel into something different. And we have them in the Catholic Church. We have, we have uh, people who are taking New Age theology and twisting Catholicism into New Age theology. We have people taking um, uh, sexual ideologies and twisting that into Christianity and, and, and uh, environmentalism and twisting it into Christianity. It, it's all over the place. And I, I'm not just blaming evangelicals. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but we, we Catholics have got loads of this junk too. Yeah. Well, that's really profound and really helpful. And so there, there's a couple avenues I want to take that down. You know, I, I often think about these very same things. They're things that are often on my mind 
And I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. I think there's a writer, James K. Smith, who writes wonderfully on this idea of being catechized by our culture. And he's a student of Augustine, did his PhD on him. But sometimes I walk away from these things and you see the just amount of things that are influencing us and the ways in which we are so much more thoroughly American, if you will, than we are Christian, or we are so much more thoroughly catechized by Netflix, say, than our every, you know, our, than scripture or than the church. And there begins to be this feeling of, oh my goodness, what, what should we do with this? And so where, where do people go from here? If they begin to look around and say, I think he's actually talking about me here. I think I've done this. I, I've woven in some things that I didn't even see that these were affecting my worldview, but I just had these baseline assumptions that don't come from the gospel, but actually come from my culture. How do they begin rooting these things out and being really taking on the mind of Christ to use biblical language there? Well, my new book comes out in June, so they need to read that. (laughs) Because what I've done is I've taken these 16 isms uh, in the first half of the book and explained them. And then in the second half of the book, I actually say, well, here's why here's like here's the cl- the classic christian faith and, and i've tried very hard to write this for um not just catholics but for uh all christians because increasingly with a secular materialistic atheistic world uh, we need to be on the same side and realize we're on the same side and um and to be able to say that look look again at the things which we have always said good christians should do because these are actually the antidotes and to to the to, to the poison of these different secularisms um not to accept the secularism but to correct them with with um the, the proper understanding so for instance um if you if you take the uh um if you take sentimentalism, for instance, that we were talking about, the answer to that is if if you're if the sentimentalist is saying it's all within me and my own feelings, the answer to that is education. To say no, it's not actually about you. It's about a, a third. It's an objective outside reality called education. And I, the chapter I write is emphasizing the need for classical education, uh, um, and the classical school movement is is being able to um, root the whole educational system in the objectivity of the classics and history and the great books and so forth. Um, Because the typical American uh, educational system, the state system, but also most of our so-called Christian schools are are locked into the whole sentimental, atheistic, secular, materialistic worldview. And, And my point is, like the old saying, the last thing the fish sees is the water, that these things are so embedded in our culture that we don't even see them. Uh, and so I've gone through with all 16 of these isms and tried to say, this is the Christian answer. Um, and if we are only faithful as Christians, we will be correcting this, not as an head on battle, but just by, um, living different kind of lives. Well, thank you for that. And I will be sure to put a link in the description to your website where people can stay tuned for the release in June, I believe you said, correct? Yeah. Awesome. Well, well, thank you for that. And you know, I wanted to talk a bit about in your book, um, Immortal Combat, I, I see how, how these distinguish themselves a bit as you flesh them out with this new book. But there is a sense in this book as well of confronting sin in our own lives, confronting the, the, the ways in which we're living. And you use a term that I think will have some, some baggage for some people. And even if they just read the description of your book and they hear this term spiritual warfare, it, depending on the context they grew up in, they might hear that and say, w- where is he going with this? And so as we talk about that, you know, these conversations and you bring up this idea of spiritual warfare, could you maybe break down what that is and, and what we're really locked in here? Yeah, um, I think there's a superstitious, not not superstitious, there's a superficial understanding of spiritual warfare that it's all about exorcisms and stuff. Uh, and, yeah, or praying against the devil. Um, delivery, deliverance ministry and all that. Uh, and I'm not opposed to that. I, I believe in all that. But um, what I'm getting at is um, a much deeper thing. And I use the metaphor of battle because it's actually very scriptural. 
uh, and uh, all through the scriptures is is the meta using the metaphor of battle. I mean, you read the Psalms. You know, the Lord prepares my arms, makes my arms strong for war, and trains my fingers to fight. And the Lord is my shield and my buckler, my strong fortress. And Lord, deliver me from my enemies. And all this kind of military um, uh, conflict kind of language. And then all through this, the 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 scriptures, the stories are our stories of real battle. Um, and and in the lives of the saints and in the lives of, of of the heroes of the faith, there's this always this constant theme of battle. But over the last fifty or sixty years, we've kind of played that down. And I make a joke in the book and saying, "When's the last time you sang Onward Christian Soldiers?" You haven't because they've taken it out of the hymn books. Um, we're not supposed to sing those kind of songs anymore. Fight the good fight with all our might. God is a strength and God they might. You know, we don't do sing that anymore. We sing gather together and hug each other. So. Um, so I, I've tried to bring back this metaphor of battle as the main metaphor. And in fact, um, the, in the fathers of the church, the cross was seen. Well, one of the main metaphors for the cross was Christ was uh, engaged in a great battle with Satan. And, and the cross was his battleground. And that's where he won the victory. So this is runs right through the New Testament and right through the, the early church of the early, uh, early church fathers. Uh, and so I've tried to bring this back and focus on two things. The sin of the world which is very profound, and not just the naughty things we've done, and then the victory of the cross, um, to try to get across to people, what does the cross really mean? What, how do you explain that to people in the modern world? Yes, and those are what, what two great motifs to take up in a book, and I, I hope people listening are getting excited to, to check that out. And I think today, at least I see it in the circles that I run in, I'd be curious if you see this as well, I would imagine, but I, I don't want to assume too much, that there seems to be this trend in which sin almost itself has gone out of style. It's a bit uh, last century, if you will, that, that today we, we don't talk about sin in, in those same ways or think of it like a, as a battle, like you mentioned in your book, that, that this is something that actually has, has weight to it and that, that we must fight against. Why do you think that is that we're losing that idea of the well, severity? Yeah, again, again, this goes back to Rousseau. I mean, when you when you study Rousseau, it, it's really interesting because one of the other themes of Rousseau's thought is because I am good, um, he has to account for the bad stuff in the world. And so he's, he, he's the first one to come up with this theory that it's not me who's bad, it's society that has made me bad. Okay, he blames his father who beat him for making him steal things, okay? So this is the first person in Western thought to actually say, you know, it's not me who's bad, it's, it's society, and especially the establishment uh, and the church. Uh, the Catholic Church. Okay, these people made me feel guilty with their artificial rules. These people oppressed me. These people made me do the wrong things. And out of this comes the French Revolution, okay, which is, is basic because his idea was the ordinary people are good at heart. And it's it's this corrupt society and this wicked um, hypocritical church which imposed these rules on people which made them bad. So, um, you can see where some of the uh, main uh, thoughts of, of American society come from as well, okay? And where in social teaching today and in, and in social theory today, uh, what do people say? Oh, this disadvantaged person, he committed that crime because he was brought up in a, in a broken home or in a poor family. It's society's fault, not his fault. Well, this it comes from Rousseau, okay? And this is the reason also why sin has been downplayed. Freud, again, Freud is a, is the grandson of Rousseau, and Freud also says, you know, the sex, it's just an instinct, you know, and it's society which has made you feel guilty about it. Uh, and then, uh, so it's, it's that, that in psycho modern psychology comes along and says the same thing, it's your parents' fault, you know, you know you're, 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 you're messed up because your mom loved you too much. Or you're messed up because your mom didn't love you enough. But what <laughs> to? Um, so th this is this trend, and and it's this philosophy is we're, we're bearing the fruit of philosophy that's actually two or three hundred years old. Okay, it's been around for a long time, but it's it's bearing fruit now, and this is why no one thinks of sin because two reasons: uh, they've been taught that it's society's fault, not their fault, and the second reason is that they've because of a whole long list of rules and regulations the society gave them, they began to think of sin as all the naughty things I've done. Okay, now I'm a Catholic priest, so I hear confessions and I hear people come and tell me their naughty things they've done, and I try in my book to say, look, 
those naughty things you've done are only the symptoms. The sin of the world is something much deeper and much uglier and much more profound. And we're all locked into it and we don't know we're locked into it. And people who've read my book have said, you know, whoa, okay, Father, I, I got you now. I, I can see this. And I know now why the Catholic Church talks about confessing our sins because, and why the, the key phrase in the middle of our Mass is, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because it's much more than the fact that I looked at some dirty pictures and I lost my temper in a traffic light, you know? Um, so that's what we're digging at. Yeah, and what a wonderful piece of feedback to get from people that you were able to open their eyes to the weight of this. And not only, not that that's the end in and of itself, but you talk about not only are we looking at sin here, but we're looking at the victory of the cross. And I don't think that's just a coincidence that as you see the weight of sin, you see the glory of the cross. Yeah, and uh, I've tried to do this in my, my book, my book using the uh, some of the thought of Rene Girard and uh, Max Scheller, uh, as well as... Um, Nietzsche and other thinkers to, to, to try to show the sin of the world and then show how uh, using especially Gerard's explanation of the, 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 the scapegoat mechanism, how the Lord Jesus comes into the middle of this and he is caught up in this and he becomes the victim uh, and therefore takes it on himself, but he defeats it from the inside out um, because he, he rises from the dead. If, if he had, hadn't risen from the dead, he would just have been another victim, another martyr. Um, so, yeah, this is what the book is about. And I, I think, um, I really believe that I, I have, for a lot of people, helped them to understand not only the sin of the world, but also why the cross is so important. Because if you don't understand sin, then the cross also is is empty. It doesn't really have any meaning for modern man, except um, the superficial meanings. Oh, Jesus was a martyr for the cause. Oh, Jesus shows us what love is like because he gives us himself, and that's the ultimate uh, example of love. All those things are true, but actually um, it's much more profound and much deeper and much more cosmic than that. Yes, and one of my goals with this channel, which is titled Gospel Simplicity, is to regain the sense that the gospel is really good news. Because I think sometimes we've lost that, that we have this sense of either the gospel is something that's really only tangentially related to my life, or worse, that it's just something we're ashamed of, that, that we don't really want to talk about. But I think when we understand the human condition, as well as what Christ has truly done, hopefully we can regain that sense that, no, the gospel is truly good news. And then the corollary of that is that, well, we, we like to share good news with other people, not out of obligation or out of this sense of guilt, but out of the sense of this, there is something cosmic that has happened here that has swung wide the doors for many. And I, I want people to yeah. know about that. And, and absolutely. And if, if the gospel is not about this crucial issue of sin, death, redemption, forgiveness, if it's not about that, what is it about? What is it about? It can only ever be about being nice people and making the world a better place. Uh, and that's not really religion. That's Girl Scouts selling cookies. You know, it's it's um, if it's not really about the cross and forgiveness and redemption and these crucial things, then our religion is um, just a set of table manners. You know, and then that and that's one of my big criticisms of modern American Christianity. It's not actually religion; it's something else. Yes, and I think it becomes increasingly easy to walk away from something that seems like nothing more than humanism with an obligation to go to church. And I think today, when we see the church and all of its expressions bleeding members in general and bleeding young people, I don't think it's that we're asking too much of people often. I think it's often that we're not asking anything of them. And so there's no thought of, well, what does this add to my life? Well, my my take on this is that um, the pe reason people are leaving is because it's not actually religion. Okay, it, it's you probably have come across the phrase moralistic therapeutic deism, um, and moralistic therapeutic deism is moralism, a set of rules and regulations to be nice people. Uh, therapy, um, how to help you with your weight loss problem, or how to how to you know, successfully to parent your teens, uh, or help you to overcome your addiction. Um, and uh, deism, God is there, but he's just kind of out in the cloud somewhere and he's having a nap. Okay, so that that's moralistic therapeutic deism is the perfect American kind of religion. 
because it doesn't make any demands on you. God's out there. He doesn't interfere. And it might help you to be a nicer person. Okay. But that's not religion. Religion from the dawn of time has been about mankind's encounter with the supernatural. It's w whether it is voodoo or paganism or Hinduism or, or animism, whatever religion it is, it's about mankind doing business with the other side. And it might've been with demons and angels and God and, and, and all the rest and, and gods and goddesses, but it, that's what religion is. It's about an encounter <laughs> with the supernatural with the other side. Um, and if it isn't that, it's not religion, okay? And, and therefore, uh, why are people leaving the churches? Because basically, they're going there to try to get a ham, a steak, and they've been given a veggie burger, okay? They, they, they have been given something which isn't actually religion. And so who blames them? They're saying, oh, why do I have to get up on a Sunday morning and listen and, and sing and sing bad music and listen to a, a, some fat guy giving me some tips for life? I don't need this. I can go to the gym. If I want to be a nice person, I can work at the food pantry. Okay, so why why are the churches hemorrhaging members? Uh, because they're not actually delivering what they're supposed to deliver, which is redemption and and truth and something called religion. They're giving people something else. Yes, and amen to that. I'd leave. I'd leave. I wouldn't stay. Right. I, I, I think I, I, I stay. I stay because I believe when I go to to celebrate mass. Um, I believe super, something supernatural happens on the Catholic altar that the bread and the wine are transformed into the body and blood of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. If I didn't believe that, I'd, I'd pack it in tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I think this idea that so often has, has crept into churches that, hey, that really the end-all be-all of this is to have you be a nice productive member of society that you know it doesn't doesn't curse honors your parents and is generally nice well people find they can do that without church and then well why would they wake up early on sunday to go do that but father Langenecker, this has been fantastic i have absolutely enjoyed this so much thank you so much for your time i think that is a a great place to begin to wrap this up. I mean, I could do this all day, but I would just like to invite you to share any closing thoughts as well as let people know where they can find your work and anything else that you're up to. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation and to be invited by a student at Moody Bible Institute to talk about stuff shows uh, great courage on your, on your part. And, um, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to, I've been wanting to have a, a more interface with my evangelical brothers and sisters for a long time, but I know there's still a lot of kind of anti-Catholic bias out there. And I guess if I, what I would share with your listeners of most of them are evangelicals is, um, you know, in this day and age, um, the division no longer is no longer between Catholic and Protestant. Okay. The division is between those who believe in the historic supernatural faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, his death, resurrection, and redemption for the world, and those who believe something different. Okay. And therefore, we need more and more to be listening and talking to one another if we hold to that historic faith. Um, a lot of other Catholics like me are really open to that conversation, and I hope more and more evangelicals will be as well. Um, some 20 years ago or more, there was this um, this movement called Catholics and Evangelicals Together. Most of the leaders of it have now passed away, but I would really love in some way for, for that to be rejuvenated with a new generation. And um, so if this little dialogue has been part of that, then, then uh, I'm glad it is. All I have left to say is sorry that the dog was barking earlier on. We've had a delivery here I have to go and deal with. Okay, thank you. No worries at all. And thank you so much for that. It is part of the mission of my channel to bring together Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox. And I thank you for doing that today and continuing this dialogue. It has been a pleasure. And I'll be sure to link people to your books and resources. And if you ever want to participate in more conversations like this, you are always welcome. But Father Dwight Longnecker, thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much. God bless you.